Hello, everybody. You are listening to Through Time and Clades. I'm Albert. And I'm Joan. Yeah. Um, so, we are back uh, this month with another uh, episode on interesting um, new studies relating to natural history that we uh, took note of um, over the past month. So, this is um, our first episode covering news from 2022. Um, but uh, before we jump in, um, how have you been doing? I've been doing pretty well. Um, it's been a pretty nice week. Um, turns out we're, we're still getting snow. Um, t- t- to my great surprise, this is now the th- third weekend mm. where, you know, I looked out the window and, and there's a lot of gray clouds and I'm like, oh, great, it's oh, going to wow. be a rainy day. And then, no, it started, like, flurrying <laughs> with, with really huge snowflakes. And it would do it, like, on and off for about a couple hours. Mm. Um it stopped now, so it's not going to, like, stick to the ground like it did the last couple of weekends. But, oh, it's just been a nice treat. It's really fun to, to watch the snow fall, and uh, I had to run out and get groceries, too, so I got mm. to, like, kind of stand out in it a little bit. And it was nice. It was really nice. Um, yeah, I've been catching up with a lot of of uh, a lot of media lately. Um, I took it upon myself out of sheer curiosity to watch the Ice Age franchise, because... <laughs> Disney owns Blue Sky now, which means that Blue Sky doesn't exist anymore. So it has all those movies now, um, and they're on Disney+. Plus. And you know what? I remembered growing up with some of these. Um, we had the original as a VHS, and we would watch it all the time. And uh, I remember liking it very much because it was one of those things where, as you know, the dino kid growing up, you had all kinds of dinosaur media you know, cartoons and documentaries and things. But when it came to Cenozoic mammals, that was a bit of a blind spot for Mm. me. And they didn't really have a lot of coverage. So between Walking with Beasts and the the Ice Age film, Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of just about covered things, really. (laughs) Um, And you know what? After all these years watching it again, um, I've forgotten how nice it is. Like, compared to all the films that came after it, which... My goodness, you forget that they're part of the same franchise <laughs> right. a lot of the times. Like the, the shifts in tone between them are insane, and just like the plots as well. Um, you go from this really wonderful found family film with these three, you know, lonesome ice age mammals who find a human baby and they got to return the baby to the parents, and it's very sweet, really kind of chill humor here and there with some fun visuals. And then you just, you go from that to uh, there's a giant flood that's going to destroy the whole valley. we got to get onto a giant boat that's a tree. Um, and then Jay Leno's in there for some reason. <laughs> to, oh, there's a, a underground lost world of dinosaurs. And there's this weasel voiced by Simon Pegg, who everyone loves. And, and he fights the dinosaurs. To, oh, Scrat, the little rat thing. Uh, he, he's not based on any actual animals. Right, right. He, he's, he's, he, was, he was made up for that franchise. Um, he like splits the earth and, and creates the continents. And so that means that there's these huge floods and, and earthquakes. And then now there's pirates that <laughs> have to, have to control the seas, yeah. um, to, Oh, scrap creates the solar system <laughs> and there's a comet coming to the earth and the comet's made of like metals. And it's, and this is because of like a, a prophecy where every hundred thousand years a comet crashes to Earth, and the magnetics of the comet attracts other comets, and so they have to go to a volcano to like shoot. The th- it's, it's it's insane. Mm-hmm. These movies are insane. Like the, the more in, recent in time they get, yeah. And you know what? That's kind of fun. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with these. Right. Um. So it was just it was part you know going down memory lane and part seeing this whole franchise like in order mm-hmm. um because as i age i never really followed the successive movies i think i remember i remember watching the third one in theaters with the family um but that was it and we just kind of like left it alone for a while um and i would like hear about the new ones every now and then but mostly in the context of oh wow they're making another one yeah, I right. thought, <laughs> they're not tired of it already but i guess not <laughs> um so that was kind of fun and you know what? It was certainly a hell of a lot funner than Don't Look Up, mm. which was the other movie that I finally watched this week. Um, for those of you who are not aware, this came out, I think, before Christmas time last year. So this is a Netflix original film. 
uh, by the guy who did uh, Talladega Nights and Superbad. So, like, he's known for doing, like, these these kind of dumb comedies. Um, so it's a complete, like, mood whiplash mm-hmm. to see this film where it's mostly serious. Mm-hmm. Like, it's also kind of a, like a dark comedy. Yeah. But the humor is very forced at times. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I wasn't necessarily laughing, like, all throughout. Right. You know, like, belly laugh, that kind of thing. Um, but I think the film was particularly genius in like what it tries to do so it's it's basically an allegory for how anthropogenic climate change is being treated today Mm -hmm. by the nations of the world and the general public well at least part of the general public um but instead of you know a very long-term issue that we're worrying about that is going on as we speak um this is with a comet Mm -hmm. that is discovered by these astronomers um, played by Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence, so great actors. Um, and they find this comet, and they they're able to get the size of it and the timing, and they're able to oh, it's going to hit the Earth in um, six weeks, six weeks and something days. And so okay, we got plenty of time. They call NASA and then the planetary people, and okay, we have a game plan. We can deflect this thing. Um, we just got to get the word out. And like, no one believes them. <laughs> And, and 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 the U.S. government is very like keeping it down low, like mm. they don't really care. Yeah. Um. So it's just a race to like deal with this comet before it hits, and do everything they can to let people know. And it is very uncomfortable mm. to watch all the way through. Yeah. Um. Like when I say like, like this, it's a dark comedy. Um. Like I was only maybe chuckling once or twice. But the whole time, I have like this, like this dread, <laughs> watching this whole film. Yeah. Because, in your head, like, are they? Is it actually going to work? Are they going to get the comet? You know, is is there going to be a happy ending? Mm-hmm. And, I will not say what happens at the end, but, I think regardless of, what your general opinions are on, the issues that the film covers, because the film covers a lot of ground. Um. Y- you're not going to be happy mm. walking away at the end of the movie. I'll just say that. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that, that was rough. Um, but you know what? I think that's good. Because if things like this will help more people kind of contextualize the situation we're in now mm. in the real world, you know, that's good. You know, the more the better. Um, I know a lot of climate researchers have shred lots of praise on this movie uh for not only like getting that that message out but for also just like capturing like their actual real world frustrations mm-hmm. in trying to talk to the people about climate change yeah. um which you know if you're getting that reaction from researchers like you know you're doing something right mm-hmm. yeah. um so, so yeah if, if you happen to have netflix or if you're in one of those regions where they actually are putting it in theaters um, I, I, I doubt it's still in theaters now, but I remember like some people actually went to the theaters to watch it. Um, I'd recommend it certainly. Hmm. Um, you'll be in for a ride, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> but um, I, I, I think it's it's pretty good. Hmm. Um, so that's kind of been, you know, that's kind of what I've been up to. Um, <laughs> what about you, buddy? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I guess just so uh, people are aware, um. We we had a bit of uh, we had some uh, technical issues starting this call, so uh, yeah, I, I believe you are currently speaking through your phone. So um, in case uh, mm-hmm. in case um, you know anyone notices like the audio being a little different for this episode, that that's the reason why. But um, yeah, anyways, uh, we we do what we can with what we have. Um, it, as far as I'm concerned, um, the last uh, the last week or so since we since we. Uh, previously talked um not too much new has happened that's uh, worth reporting on my end uh mostly just kind of uh, continuing with my research um and uh yeah still still kind of waiting on a time to be set for my uh, phd um, viva or defense um so uh yeah mo- mostly more of the same uh i i did make some progress in in those in those areas um also tried to work on the website our website for this show a little bit um but uh did not as much as I had hoped, um, but uh, yeah. Otherwise, uh, not not a huge amount uh, new with me. Um, however, um, uh, 
we do have uh, something else we would like to present uh, before we actually start with um, our actual news stories. Um, so uh, do we want to continue with that? Sure. <laughs> All right. So um, on the next slide, uh, so this is, this is basically something I decided to uh, kind of look into. Uh, at some point last month, I think it was it was around the time when we were um, kind of putting together our end of the year roundup um, episode, um, and so basically, um, I was inspired to do this because we often say on the show that uh, we like to cover studies that uh, not as many people have kind of talked about in the popular press. Um, so to kind of raise awareness of like more obscure or um, underappreciated uh, research. Um, and so I started wondering, well, um, there actually is a way to at least roughly measure this. Um, so how, you know, how, how often do we actually follow that kind of guideline um, or that, yeah, that, that kind of ideal? Um, do, do we really cover research that is not often covered by other people? Um, and so the way I decided to measure this is by using uh, what is called an altmetric score. And so the term altmetric, uh, it, it basically originates, um, I believe, as essentially uh, from alternative metric, um, because the typical way, the standard way in academia, um, or at least one, one of the standard ways in which uh, we kind of uh, measure how influential a certain study is, is basically by how many other scientific papers cite a certain study. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that kind of makes sense, right? Like, uh, if, a, if a study, if information from a study was used, or if someone would decide to respond to a study in another study, uh, that, that would suggest that, yeah, that this, uh, this other study ha has had some influence on, uh, you know, uh, scientific uh, research uh, by other authors. Um, however, uh, of course, um, even though scientists are the main target audience of scientific papers, uh, it, it isn't really only scientists that talk about scientific studies, right? And not to mention that uh, it's not really only in scientific literature that uh, people comment on um, scientific papers, obviously, because uh, we're doing this show, which is not a scientific paper, and we talk about scientific studies. Um, and so uh, a lot of them, this other kind of discussion outside of the scientific literature has been grouped together under the term like altmetric, like how much is a study being talked about in these other kind of spheres or outlets. Um, and so, uh, like, these can include, say, uh, news reports or social media, like uh, people tweeting about studies, for example, or commenting about them on Facebook, um, like uh, blog articles. Uh, it can include, like, videos, like the ones we're making on this channel. Um, and so there are a number of different websites that actually keep track of this kind of thing, like how, how often is a paper being discussed in these kind of uh, non-strictly -ac academic um, locations um, on the internet. And um, uh, one of these is altmetric.com. There are some others, but uh, I, I think um, altmetric.com, uh, for one thing, it tends to be easier to use. And also um, I, a lot of the major journals kind of partner up with it. So it's kind of easier to uh, e extract the, this kind of information. Also, it, I think it also covers a lot more ground than some of the other um, websites that measure similar things. Um, like the diversity of the um, types of outputs it it, um, it looks at is, uh, from what I've seen, a, a fair bit greater than some of the other kind of major um, websites that do this. Um, for example, altmetric.com covers like YouTube videos, like what we do on this channel, and uh, look, it tries to it tries to collect like blog articles that talk about papers and, and such. And not, not all of these uh, websites do this. Um, and so, uh, what I did was I decided to go to all the previous papers we've talked about in our new studies. Um, so I, I didn't I didn't look at papers that we um, referenced for say our uh, lecture series like Dinosaurs: The Second Chapter or um, uh, Humanity: A Prologue. Um, but uh, I I did um, I did go back to all the studies that we have covered in our um, news episodes, and also I I also included um, studies that we covered for a Paleo Rewind last year as well. Um, and decided to look at uh, what altmetric score altmetric.com gave each of those studies. Um, now, I will mention that uh, not all um, journals, uh, like altmetric.com does not work on all journals. Uh, it, they, it kind of depends a bit on how the website is set up and whether or not like uh, the journal is on 
of metrics radar and such. Um, but uh, for the vast majority of um, like major scientific publishers, like their their papers, you, you can get an altmetric score for those. And uh, I, I think out of all the papers we have covered in our series so far, um, only two of them did not have an altmetric score, or you could not get an altmetric score out of them. So I guess those are real outliers. Like the vast majority, I was able to get a score for them. Um, and uh, if you're ever curious about like what altmetric score a paper has, um, a lot of the time, uh, journals make it pretty easy for you, um, like because they'll actually partner up with Altmetric, and then they'll have a little like Altmetric icon on the side of the paper if you poke around and look. Um, you you might have to dig a little bit. It might be under a tab that says Metrics or something, uh, so it might not be like directly visible immediately. But like usually, you if you you know, have a, have a look around on the journal website uh, where the where the paper is um, uploaded, you you can you can often find a, a little tab that says metrics or something like that. Or you might be able to see um, a symbol similar to the one that I put on the slide here, this uh, rainbow donut symbol. Um, and uh, that, that's, by the way, not like uh, some something I just made up. Like I know like altmetric.com actually calls the symbol the donut symbol. So um, yeah, it, it, it looks like this. Um, there will often be uh, several different colors on it. And uh, each color um, represents a different type of um, kind of media, I guess. Like I believe red is like news reports. Um, yellow is blogs. Uh, the kind of sort of cyan blue is uh, Twitter. Um, I think the gray is a uh, Wikipedia articles. And so, yeah, all, all of these things, the uh, altmetrics takes, takes into account. Um, and the colors that rep have the larger uh, proportion. So in this case, like you can see that the cyan Twitter kind of color, uh, represents a larger portion of the donut, uh, represents, you know, there are more like tweets about this article than there are like blog articles or news reports, which, which is, you know, in some ways kind of expected. Um, and then it um so it it's not a straightforward kind of a formula where like two hundred people tweet about this so it, it gets a score of two hundred like uh different types of sources are kind of weighted differently um so like uh I think like tweets are kind of quote unquote worth less um, whereas like news reports are worth more um but in in the end altmetric does some kind of calculation and it gives the paper an altmetric score and and that's usually represented in the middle of the altmetric donut um. Now, uh, there are some journals that haven't directly partnered up with Altmetric, or they might use some other Altmetric website to calculate their Altmetric score. Um, but um, most of the time, you can still get an Altmetric score um, based on Altmetric.com for those papers. Um, and that's because Altmetric.com actually provides like a little... Um, um, it's kind of add-on to your browser. Um, you can download it from their website, and uh, if you uh, have that little add-on, you can like just click on it whenever you're on the page on the website for a scientific paper. And most of the time, like other than uh, those few uh, journals that are exceptions, like I mentioned earlier, most of the time you can still get an altmetric score um, ba based on an altmetric.com, despite uh, e even if that journal hasn't actually. Uh, uh, doesn't has hasn't actually added like a rainbow kind of donut symbol to the, its actual website. Um, so yeah, that, that's uh, that's if you want to want to check out uh, what what papers Altmetric um, uh, scores are uh, out of your your own uh, curiosity. Um, the Altmetric score that I show on the slide here actually is uh, from um, a paper I co-authored on um, you know describing Asteriornis, one of the oldest known uh, modern type birds in the fossil record. Um, and uh, this is a um, this is this was a nature paper, so uh, describing a uh, you know Mesozoic theropod dinosaur. And so naturally it has uh, the highest altmetric score out of any um, study that I have co-authored so far and I kind of expected to stay that way. Um, but uh, so it has an altmetric score as, as of the time that I got the symbol um, from the website. I copied the symbol from the website. It had an altmetric score of um, 1484. Uh, Rather for fourteen hundred and eighty four, and so uh, that that's a very that's a very high altmetric score. Like uh, anything over a thousand, uh, I would consider like th this is very high. Like a lot of a lot of people have talked about it in the news and on social media and so on. Um, whereas most of the time, altmetric scores tend to be much lower than that. Um, and altmetric scores can, of course, change over time. So if you know slowly over time a paper accumulates more tweets about it or more reports about it uh, the altmetric score can increase so um, 
the altmetric scores that I got when I uh, was uh, kind of ca um, compiling this information, um, they, they're not necessarily going to stay, stay the same. Um, um, like if you go look at them now, for example. But um, in general, uh, I would say like within a month or so of a paper coming out, uh, it's likely that the altmetric score is going to stabilize around that number. Um, it probably won't change a huge amount because, of course, most news reports you know come out uh, when when a shortly after a new paper comes out. So uh, there probably aren't going to be like many more news reports um, following that period of time after a paper comes out. Um, so essentially, I recorded altmetric scores um, for all the studies that we covered in our previous news episodes. Uh, these scores are as of January 2022. Um, and so our previous news episodes covered a period of um, so studies that came out between July 2020 and December 2021. Um, and so overall, the average score um, of all the uh, studies that we that we covered combined um, was uh, 661. Um, so I, I would say that's a fairly high altmetric score. Um, and uh, over 30% have an altmetric score uh, less than or equal to 200. And um, over half have an altmetric score less than or equal to 500. Um, and so uh, you, you can see that um, very high altmetric scores probably are having like a, a strong effect on this um, on this average score here. Um, and there, to my knowledge, um, I I mean I don't know because I haven't really looked. So maybe people have done this, but like I, I don't think there's like any kind of like standard scale for what counts as a high altmetric score. Uh, and I'm sure it probably varies from field to field anyway. Um, so the, these are sort of kind of arbitrary numbers I picked out kind of based on just personal impressions and experience. Um, so like I would say that if an alt, uh, a paper has an altmetric score uh, equal to or lower than 200, uh, I would consider that a relatively obscure paper. Like obviously some people are talking about it or else it wouldn't have, have any, any um, score higher than zero at all. But um, I, I would say that probably uh, most papers that are less than or equal to 200 in altmetric score um, haven't been covered like very extensively in mainstream media. Um, for scores between 200 and 500, I would say that they, they probably have had some attention from mainstream news news media, that there might, might have been a few news reports about it. Um, and probably like lay people who have a uh, casual interest in uh, the topic of the study uh, have probably heard of it. Um, but uh, they, they, those studies probably didn't like you know completely like blow up uh, into the mainstream. Like uh, the average person on the street probably wouldn't have heard of it. Um, and if it's higher than five hundred, I would say that um, there is a pretty good chance that it made it, it into some like major mainstream news outlets, um, and that yeah, you know, these are probably the kinds of studies that. Uh, someone in your family who does not study what you study might call you up and say, hey, did you hear about this? <laughs> that kind of that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say like uh, 500 is probably like a reasonable threshold in my experience for like uh, kind of the mainstreamness of a study, you could say. So uh, I guess uh, what this means for our coverage, well, I, I would say o over half of our um, studies um, have an altmetric score uh, uh, less than or equal to 500. So, um, yeah, I would say I would say in general, uh, we were doing a pretty uh, fairly decent job of like looking at uh, giving like relatively underappreciated studies like their fair share of attention. Um, and I will say that you know obviously, uh, kind of the obscurity of a study is only one factor uh, we look at or consider when we decide what stories to pick. Like that, that's obviously not the only kind of uh, um, uh, thing that we that we're thinking about. Uh, and some some studies that even though people might have um, covered before, they, they're just cool stories, so we want to cover them. Um, and uh, I, I would say like probably one of the main things that we we consider when we um, when when we decide to pick stories is like. Uh, whether or not like we can make any kind of novel commentary on it compared to other people's coverage, um, like whether, whether there's any kind of um, additional common commentary or insight that we we can provide on those studies, um, at least compared to most other mainstream uh, reports. And so, um, yeah, like re regardless of like 
the actual abundance of like reports that have covered those studies. Um, and uh, just as a bit of trivia, I guess, like you just look at like what the highest and lowest scores are uh, in terms of like the, the studies that we have covered. Um, by far, the highest score of all the studies that we have covered was um, a, a study on uh, sea slugs of all things. So this, you might recall, uh, was in our March 2021 episode where we looked at these um, sea slugs that are able to like voluntarily break off their own bodies, leaving only their head and then kind of regenerate their entire uh, body again. Um, and that study got a an altmetric score of over 5,500. That's an incredibly high altmetric score. Like, yeah, I... I <laughs> I know of very few papers that get even close to that. Um, so yeah, that, that, that study is definitely pulling our average up by a lot, I think. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I would not have expected that that particular study would be like the highest score of, 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 all, the, of all the papers that we, we have covered. Because like, you know, it's on sea slugs. Like, you, you don't get sea slugs in mainstream news media every day. But uh, yeah, it, I mean, it was an incredible finding. So I, I can see why it, it got so much attention. Um, and the lowest score, I, I was also kind of surprised by this too. So this was um, a study that we covered in the October 2020 episode. Um, and if you're wondering why um, the study is dated to 2021 on this slide, um, that is not a typo. Um, that is because um, a lot of the time papers, um, after they are accepted by the journal, have, have already gone through the peer review process and so on. Uh, some journals will like just straight up put the paper on their website uh, once they've been accepted. Um, mm -hmm. And so the paper is technically released at that point. Um, however, um, it might still be a few months before the paper gets collected into like a print version of the journal. Now, some journals um, today are entirely online and don't have a print version at all, but many, many still do. Um, and so oftentimes the... Um, the print version of the journal, like that, that particular issue, it comes out much later than when the paper was first uh, put online. And so the final um, date that is given to the paper might be um, different from the time when it actually was released. Uh, but normally when we do the show, we go by like the initial kind of online release date of these papers. And so uh, we covered this paper in October 2020, even though it wasn't like formally compiled into a journal issue, um, an issue of the journal until 2021. Um, but in any case, that particular paper was about a troodontid dinosaurs and kind of the feasibility of them kind of sitting on their nests to, to incubate their eggs, um, which I thought was a really interesting study because like, they did an actual experiment with like a, a, a water heater or something and, and like placed it on top of some eggs to try and keep it warm. I, I thought that was really, really neat. Um, and I, I would have expected like that paper to have gotten more attention because it's about dinosaurs and they did a, a fun experiment to find out how dinosaurs might have lived. And, but uh, no, it had to, uh, the lowest score of all the studies that we, we have covered um, with a score of 14 which yeah is a, is a pretty low score um so so yeah that, that was surprising I, I i did not expect that and it, it was definitely fun to kind of compile this data together um and uh yeah <laughs> do, do you have any thoughts about the, this compilation of data oh I, I mean i was very curious too because like yeah part of our goal in this series uh, of, of news episodes has been to just kind of maybe give a little bit more highlights to papers that you know we felt weren't getting talked about too too much mm -hmm. um or might just be of, of curiosity anyway um yeah and so like that means that we tend to we tend to steer away from like like the big news stories of the month mm -hmm. you know like we, we that you could probably find just about anywhere um but i was really pleased to see like the actual data on how we were doing and it seemed like you know we, we we've been on the right track basically <laughs> with what we'd been planning um there were a couple of like, you know, kind of obvious things that I noticed in yeah. the data, like papers about hominins or um, particular new dinosaurs, mm -hmm. like that we, that we cover. Like, yeah, those t would tend to have higher scores. Right. Um, that's definitely what I've noticed because, like, those are I, I definitely among the general public. Like, those are topics of interest. Yep. Um, there are there are also a couple of surprises here and there as well. Um, so all in all, I'm, I'm just I'm I'm pleased that what we've been doing has been at least reaching more people than maybe it would otherwise. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely happy that you were able to put this together. 
It was definitely interesting. And yeah, I mean, any of you uh, listeners or viewers, uh, like, uh, you know, in your experience, like, ha- have we, like, you know, given given you, like, information that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise? Like, let us know. I, I think I'd be very curious to get some, like, kind of qualitative um, assessment of that. Um, now, uh, one final thing I'll add before we move on is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, like, altmetric.com does keep track of YouTube videos um, that cover studies. Um, so, yeah, they, they cover, like, uh, for example, our, our news episodes um, get get uh, counted into these altmetric scores um, most of the time. And so uh, if you are, you know, someone who reports on scientific research or, like, especially someone who also makes YouTube videos about um, new studies, um, and you are curious to see whether your... Um, you know, your work is being counted into these altmetric scores. You you can you can go check that because, like I said, you can go onto a paper's website and then see what the altmetric score is. And if you click into it, it'll give you a breakdown of like you know what are the sources talking about this study. Um, and so you can check whether or not they have like included your video in their in their count. Um, now, if you don't see your video in your account or like you know, in any other kind of um, uh, media that that you produce. Um, there are a few possible reasons for this. Um, so, um, for, first of all, is uh, you have to include a link to the paper um, in the say say it's a YouTube video. You have, you have to include a link to the paper like in your YouTube description, um, and if you don't do that, it, the altmetric.com is not going to pick it up. Um, so yeah, make, make sure you do that if you want to be counted as part of the altmetric score. Um, so like our um, lecture series, like I mentioned previously, they don't get counted into the altmetric score, even though we cite a ton of papers for Lowe's because we, we put the um, uh, our references for Lowe's lecture se- um, series episodes in like separate documents, as you might have noticed if you check those out. Um, and of course, part of the reason for that is practical because we cite so many studies for those episodes that we can't possibly fit them all in the description. Um, and part part of that is because our like news, um, well, not news, um, lecture series aren't really intended to be like news reports anyway. And so it, I, I feel like it kind of matters less if we're not counted um, as part of the coverage here. Um, but uh, yeah, for our for our news. Um, for our news uh, episodes, we tend to put like links directly in the description, um, with with a couple exceptions. Like for our um, roundup episodes, for example, because we cover so many studies in those, I I also tend to put like um, our links in a separate uh, document, um, except for the main uh, previous month kind of studies. Like you know, if you if you've seen our roundup episodes, you you probably get what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, yeah, basically, if you want your if you want your uh, reports to be counted in the altmetric score, you have to put the link um, to the paper in your YouTube description, or like in, in your blog post or whatever it is. Um, now, uh, secondly, um, you might have to tell alt- altmetric.com to like actually scan your channel or your blog or whatever. Um, uh, sometimes they might have already picked it up. Uh, they might already be aware of you. But um, other times you might have to actually suggest your channel as like uh, one of the sources that they, they check. Um, and you can do that on their website. Like they, they have a form that you can fill out and then you can you can just submit it to them. And like within you know a, a week or two, they'll, they'll probably start like, you know, gathering content from your channel and picking your up your uh, your reports uh, if they uh, assuming they don't take any issue with, with your with, with your um, with your channel of course um, so I you know I, I don't really know how like the decision process in that works but uh pretty much every time I've suggested a source to them they have ended up picking it up so I mean uh, I, I think it's, it's pretty straightforward to do that and by, by the way no I, I when I've suggested sources to them, like I haven't only suggested sources that I run, so it's not just this channel, but like I, I've I've tried to you know suggest um, sources to them that I, I know of that that regularly cover scientific papers, but they might not might not have been on their radar. So uh, yeah, uh, try try to help everyone out there. Um, and thirdly, it can take a little bit of time for the um, the uh, altmetric to like pick up on your report. Like if you like have just released your video and then you go and check them like it probably won't have registered yet um it, it might take like a few hours or even a few days before they, they actually pick up your video or your uh, uh essay or or whatever it is um but uh yeah usually give it give it a little time and if they're aware of you as a source then they they will probably include it and so yeah uh, basically that that's uh, that's about it uh 
that that's probably the main things you need to know in my experience um if you want your coverage to be counted among this um, altmetric score and you know by by doing so i'm sure you will be sort of you know helping raise the profile of the papers themselves too and so everybody uh, gets a little bit of promotion out of that um all right uh but uh i guess if you don't have anything else to add uh, we can finally you know, get around to our news stories sure no i'm glad that you were able to get that information out there yeah i'm definitely curious to see how other channels and media are, are doing with their altmetric scores it's that's good information to have mm -hmm. definitely <laughs> all right so um our first story of this month uh is uh okay so it's one of mine uh, that uh, that i i tend to cover um this study is about the effects of incomplete fossils on phylogenetics. So phylogenetics, of course, is the study of how organisms are related to one another, um, as you're probably familiar with if you're a regular listener. Um, and uh, yeah, something that really um, concerns us uh, when it comes to figuring out the phylogenetics of fossil organisms is what the effect of uh, incomplete uh, fossils has because after all if you only have like part of an organism's body uh, that can make it very difficult to figure out like what kind of organism it was now sometimes you know some organisms have very distinctive features that if you're lucky enough to find that like, even just a little part of them you can probably have a decent idea of what they are but that's certainly not always the case uh, so in general the less of an organism you have like the less confident we can be um, in like actually kind of placing it within a phylogenetic tree um, and so that's a definitely a major source of concern for paleontologists or other researchers who work with fossils. Um, so this new study decided to look at kind of um, what the effect the incomplete fossil record has on squamate phylogenetics. It's squamates, like we have spoken of before on the show, like when we talked about a tetrapodophis, the weird um, uh, kind of supposed early snake that probably was not actually a, a snake um uh squamates are basically the lizards um so it's the lizard group in the broad sense um so uh, a lot of time people will, will say that the squamates are the lizards the snakes and the amphisbenians were worm lizards but uh, technically snakes and worm lizards are both types of legless lizards and so yeah pretty much uh, you could you could also call all squamates lizards and um uh, the squamate fossil record um, is certainly one that um, suffers a fair bit from like incomplete fossils. It's pretty rare to find a complete fossil of a squamate. Um, and so the authors of this new study, uh, they decide to survey fossil squamate collections, collections of uh, squamate fossils, and to try and figure out just how incomplete the fossil, um, you know, the squamate fossil record is. And they found that disproportionately, most specimens of um, fossil squamates um, that are held in museum collections tend to be either jaw bones or vertebrae, um, and not so much uh, bones from the top of the skull or bones from the limbs. So we say that the uh, jaw bones and the vertebrae are overrepresented um, in fossil squamate collections compared to other parts of the squamate body. Um, and that's kind of what's represented in the figure here. You can see like a lizard skeleton being shown here and they put the vertebrae and the ribs as well and the jaw bones in green. Um, and also uh, the, the green basically, the green basically representing um, overrepresented fossil uh, skeletal regions. Um, and the back of the skull and the limbs are in blue representing the underrepresented uh, um, skeletal region. So these parts of the body are found less often in squamate fossils. Okay, so how does this affect our ability to figure out like what these fossil squamates actually are and how they're related to like other types of squamates? Um, so to kind of assess this question, um, what the uh, what the authors did was they, they took um, two major uh, morphological data sets, so data sets of like anatomical features of squamates. Um, so two major data sets that have been used in previous phylogenetic studies, and then they kind of separated out um, characters, so features representing different parts of the skeleton. Um, so for example, they separated out the the characters relating to the jaw as a, as a category, and uh, the characters relating to the back of the skull as another category, and so on. Um, and then they uh, mapped out uh, all these features onto like uh, 
previously established like squamate phylogenies based on these previous data sets. Um, and what's interesting is that like these two different data sets, they find phylogenies that don't quite agree with each other. And so they could, the authors could test like whether or not like our, our actual understanding of the phylogenetics um, changes um, the effects of their study. Like um, if you follow like one particular phylogeny, like does, does these, um, these underrepresented versus overrepresented skeletal regions like make much of a difference. Um, and uh, it turns out that the answer to that question, at least uh, based on their study, uh, is not so much. Like the, the two different types, the two different like uh, competing phylogenies doesn't, didn't really affect the, um, uh, the results of their study by a whole lot. So that, that's kind of encouraging. Um, but uh, what they actually did was that they um, calculated phylogenetic signals. So basically how reliable are each of these characters for like uh, determining the placement of these, um, uh, of these squamates like, you know, compared to other types of characters, um, or at least, uh, technically like the metrics that they, that they study were, were basically measuring like how much convergence does each of these, uh, characters have. Now uh, you can see on the, uh, tables here that on the vertical axis, there's a scale from zero to one. And basically uh, the closer to one you are, the less, um, the less convergence there is for these characters. And so if you split these characters into overrepresented versus underrepresented regions of the body uh, in terms of the fossil record, um, you can see that their results here, they find that there actually isn't much of a difference. There isn't really a significant difference between the overrepresented skeletal regions versus the underrepresented skeletal regions in terms of the amount of convergence present. And so uh, in theory, at least, uh, they should, uh, contain about roughly equal phylogenetic signal. And so even if you only know a uh, squamate from its jaw, then at least uh, based on the findings here, uh, you should still be able to be as confident um, in its phylogenetic placement as you can be if you only had, say, the back half of the skull. And that's, in some ways, that's pretty encouraging because um, a lot of these, these data sets, they tend to like like represent uh, different parts of the body unequally as well. Like there tend to be a lot of characters relating to the back of the skull and not as much for the vertebrae, for example. Um, and so uh, people have wondered, well, did, would that affect like our ability to place like these fossils in a phylogenetic context? And so according to this study, at least, um, it seems that uh, these underrepresented, or rather, um, these overrepresented skeletal regions in the fossil record still contain uh, just as much phylogenetic signal as the underrepresented skeletal regions. And so that is good news for those of us who study fossils, and uh, that we can probably still get a pretty good sense of what these squamates are just by studying like even the limited remains of them that we have. Um, now, that, that being said, uh, I feel like another way in which this might be, someone might be able to read this might be that, uh, well, these characters are giving us equally wrong phylogenetic signals. Um, and, and so uh, I, I would be interested to like um, see an actual experiment done where, for example, someone ran a phylogenetic analysis of like living squamates uh, where we have a pretty good confidence in the phylogenetic relationships but only included like characters from like a particular body region or something like that, or, or like, like r randomly select a few taxa in your living, in your like modern kind of, uh, taxon sample, and then, uh, like make, make some of them into like pseudo fossils. Like you, you take out all the characters except for a certain body region for a modern species and then throw it into one of these data sets and see if you can still get it in the right place. Um, I think that would be a study that would be worth doing. Um, because what they did here was they basically just like, they, they did like these calculations for like how convergent these characters are, which uh, definitely gives us a sense of like how much phylogenetic signal there is. But yeah, it would be interesting to see like an actual like experimental kind of study, um, like seeing how the incompleteness uh, directly like affects the uh, phylogenetic uh, results. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I thought this was a really interesting study, and obviously it's a, an issue that uh, some phylogeneticists are very concerned with. And um, I think uh, definitely in some ways it is an encouraging finding to, to find that uh, the uh, overrepresented skeletal regions in squamates um, does contain uh, at least as much phylogenetic signal as other parts of the body that we might not be seeing in the fossils. Um, well, what do you think? Yeah, this is really fascinating to me. Um... I'm definitely curious, like, how this would work for, like, 
other groups of animals. Mm-hmm. Um, like I'm because like in some instances, like what characters you use can make all the difference. Right. Yeah. Um, in terms of like leading debates, like I know in paleoanthropology right now, there's a big concern about Homo floresiensis, mm. the, the the hobbits of Flores Island. Um, when you look at the post crania. Those bones tell you that Homo friesiensis is descended from species kind of like Homo habilis. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the skull, then the relationship shifts, and it's looking more like a descendant of, say, Homo erectus. And if you know anything about Homo habilis and Homo erectus, those are two very different hominins right. with very different cultures. And so like, it's a big enigma right now about where the Flores hobbits go in the hominin family tree. So, yeah, I I would be curious to see how this this would work with, you know, say, hominins, Mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Um, Or, because I I do wonder, and granted, you know, my my knowledge of Squamate fossil history is probably about as good as the average Mm -hmm. non-specialist. But I I feel like a lot of lizards kind of share a lot of similar anatomy enough to where depending on what bones you use like it probably wouldn't be too big of a stretch to to figure out where they go in the general family tree Mm -hmm. um but i I could be wrong um this is just my, my kind of my general impression um but uh yeah no i i definitely like the idea of testing this with living animals Mm. first it's kind of like the like the next step, right? Because um, I know, for example, there was a study that was done on the Denisovan DNA, mm. where certain genes were able to tell you like what kinds of phenotypic traits a Denisovan would have. Mm-hmm. Um, but in order to do that, they tested it first on chimps and on Neanderthals, which we have very good data on. Yeah. And by testing the accuracy of those methods. That got kind of the same results that we see in you know living chimps and in Neanderthals. Mm-hmm. Then they had more confidence to use it for Denisovans and get their results. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe I talked about this um, in a previous episode. I forget which one at the moment, but uh, yeah, I definitely like that idea. Um, but I thought this was very fascinating, nonetheless. Mm-hmm. I'd have to uh, share some of your <laughs> some of your thoughts there. Yeah, it, it is true that like. Um in in some other animal groups we have found like evidence that uh certain skeletal regions or anatomical regions um contain more reliable phylogenetic signal than others and so um yeah i, I think uh, i think it would be worth like testing this on like other groups too because i i would definitely expect that this is not a one-size-fits-all situation uh probably you will find like variation for some other um for some other groups, like, for example, I, I know that uh, the mammal fossil record is dominated a lot by, by teeth. And uh, there have been like some, yeah. yeah, and some previous studies have concluded that uh, teeth are actually a relatively less reliable kind of uh, source of phylogenetic information for mammals. And so, yeah, even though like uh, uh, mammal paleontologists are all about teeth because that's often most of what they have to work with, um, it, it it might not always be like the most reliable way to test like the phylogenetic relationships. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to see like something like that being done um, for other, other groups of animals for sure. Um, but yeah, um, otherwise, uh, do we want to go to your first story? Sure, we can do that. Um, so I guess from here on out, all the stories we're going to talk about concern very big animals. That's right. Um, which is actually kind of funny how that, that works. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this case, the, the largest known animals in the world today mm. are the whales. And that's specifically the rorquals of the clade Balaenopteridae. Um, such big animals, they're remarkably streamlined and can move fairly quickly underwater, mm-hmm. which is a far cry from the bloated, heavy set animals of vintage books, <laughs> which, you know, granted, those were based on dead beach specimens. Mm-hmm. Um, so the rorquals include things like the blue whale and the humpback and the fin whale, for example, among many others. I think there's about like 10 or 15 species that we have now. Um, and a fascinating aspect of their biology is how they feed. Given that the largest animals feed on some of the smallest, 
it follows that rorquals have to eat quite a bit in order to sustain themselves. Now, these whales engage in lunge feeding, which is a highly specialized behavior whereby the animal swims rapidly upon a cloud of krill or small fish, opening the mouth widely and creating a pocket where water is sucked in so fast that it pulls the animals inside. Um, the water and food enters an expandable throat pouch that balloons when the mouth closes to almost half the size of the animal, mm. which is facilitated by the grooves or pleats that run vertically along the underside of the animal. So it's kind of like how an umbrella works. Yeah. And once inside, the whale then filters the animals with the hair-like fibers of its baleen, pushing the water out of the mouth and slowly distending the balloon as it does so. And now the whale can use its massive elastic tongue to lick off all the krill or fish, and after several hours of repeated lunch feeding, it can consume many tons of food, which is needed to sustain its huge warm-blooded body. Now, marine biologists have spent many years observing and dissecting whirlpools in order to truly understand how lunge feeding works, considering how it, it really almost pushes the limits on what the body is capable of doing. Um, there was one 2012 study by Nicholas D. Pinison and colleagues, which found evidence of a special sensory organ inside the chin, which is actually unfused, which can detect signals in the water and then tell the brain when the time is right for lunging. Uh, and then there's a 2017 study by Margot A. Lilly and colleagues that discovered how the peripheral nerves in the neck are actually able to withstand the stress from ballooning by being adapted into a weighty shape, kind of like pasta, that can stretch and recoil easier without breaking, um, which is just amazing to me. And, you know, that's all well and good on the outer parts of the whale. But what about inside? Mm. You know, how does the anatomy of the whale's mouth and throat work during lunch feeding? I mean, if I tried to swallow a whole jug of water and go, I'm going to have a lot of problems. Whales seem to do it just fine. Well, until recently, you know, we've been able to piece out some key details so whales, like most mammals, have an epiglottis, which is a, a flap of tissue that works kind of like the lid on a garbage can. Hmm. It closes the trachea during swallowing so that food doesn't get inside. Um, but theirs is different. So they actually rely on another organ called the corniculate flap to help in closing the windpipe. So they kind of work together to ensure the closure. Um, now, in regards to the nasal cavity leading to the blow holes, so uh, if you're curious, baleen whales have two, while toothed whales like dolphins have just one. Um, it's a great way to tell them apart. Uh, there is a fleshy nasal plug that slides back towards the top of the cavity to keep water out during swallowing. Um, but researchers have had trouble visualizing how the soft palate keeps food from entering during lunge feeding and swallowing as most mammals, and this is kind of fun to know, they can actually breathe while they're eating because their nasal and uh, esophageal tracts are kind of arranged in different ways to allow that in the first place. Um, we're very different in that we have you know, a wide pharynx where all those holes mm -hmm. go to the same kind of general area so you can understand why choking is a problem with, with humans, whereas other animals can manage it just fine. Well, that's where uh, Kelsey and Jill and colleagues come in. They perform dissections on adult fin whales. So that's the second largest species of rorqual after the blue, and by extension, the second largest animal in the world. Mm -hmm. And they took a peek inside their mouths. And, you know, everything seemed accounted for. But they noticed a very strange, fleshy, bulbous sac along the soft palate, which completely obscured the opening to the throat or what is known as the oropharyngeal channel in technical speak, uh, this was a completely new organ that was never noticed before, mm. or at least was not reported on. And so the authors decided to give it a name. They call it the oral plug, as it seemed very similar to the nasal plug. Now, the authors actually had trouble pushing it away, you know, to see inside the throat better. So they deduced that the whale maintained the oral plug 
in this state at rest, relying on active muscle movement in order to shift it. And you know what they did? They were able to cut into it, and they actually found muscle tissue mm. as well as adipose fat. So that seemed to check out. Um, now, in order to understand the oral plug better, they also dissected fetal fin whales, so in a very uh, embryonic state. And they found it there, too, uh, albeit in a very developing form. You know, It wasn't fully there yet, as is usually expected. Now, because it doesn't seem really feasible to strap an endoscope on a live whale and watch it lunch feed to see these organs in action, the authors proposed a model for how the oral plug could work. And you can see that demonstrated in the illustrations here on this slide. So while the Rorqual is breathing, so when it comes up for air, uh, the oral plug rests on the soft palate normally, which itself rests on the tongue. The epiglottis is pushed to the side, and the corniculate flap closes the esophagus uh, to provide basically a direct channel from the nasal cavity to the lungs. Now, this is actually fun to look up. You might be curious if this is how water is kept out of the respiratory system to prevent drowning. Um, the fact is that, you know, different whale species surface with different blows of misty water. Mm. And that should kind of clue you in that it really doesn't work. And indeed, there was a 2020 paper by uh, Maria Clara Eusen Martins and colleagues that seems to have confirmed that even like during and after breathing, water enters the blowhole all the time, mm. um, which raises some concerns about how easily toxins and pollutants can enter enter the respiratory system. But that's a story for another day. So while the Rorqual is engaging in lunch feeding, the sheer force of the incoming water and food actually causes the tongue to invert and kind of help direct that into the throat pouch for, for filtering. And so the relaxed state of the oral plug thus completely blocks the pharynx while this is happening. And that keeps the whale from choking while it's filtering out all the, the food and water. And so while the whirlpool is actually in the process of swallowing, that oral plug then pushes back against the nasal cavity through this muscular action, working with the epiglottis and the corniculate flap to basically provide a clear runway from the mouth to the esophagus. And that's interesting because that makes the oral plug very similar to the uvula mm. that we and our closest primate relatives have. Um, but no other mammal really has. Um, and part of its role, it has many, um, is to close up the nasopharynx during swallowing, um, which, you know, is kind of faulty. Um, <laughs> doesn't always work. Uh, I'm sure many of you have hung out with friends or family during a meal, uh, laughing at some joke while trying to take a drink, um, only for it to shoot up out of your nose. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've definitely been there. The worst is when it's soda. Um, <laughs> now, uh, given that it would take some seriously bold research to demonstrate that all this occurs in the first place, um, this is nonetheless a very important step in the direction of understanding, truly understanding lunge feeding in rorqual whales. Hmm. Um, it's such a specialized feature for a mammal in the first place that it kind of makes sense that they would have all this sort of particular anatomy evolve in order to make it work so well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it certainly makes a lot of sense to me. Um, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, uh, I, I think it seems like a very reasonable model as well. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's just fascinating the more we learn about whales. I, they, man, because whales, whales are just incredible creatures. <laughs> I think most people can agree about that. Um, and there's so little that we know about them. Like, even though they're incredibly popular for many reasons, and there are loads of researchers studying whales, but we're just learning these new things that were previously not recognized all the time. And yeah, it's al always, always um, amazing to hear more news about about uh, whale anatomy and how whales lived and so on. Um, so I would guess that they would mean this would mean that the um, 
the blue whale scene in Finding Nemo probably wouldn't exactly work the way depicted, right? <laughs> if the, uh, um, oh, right, yeah. Yeah, if, if, the, if the whale couldn't shoot something out of its blowhole at the same time it was swallowing, it probably wouldn't have been able to eject uh, Marlin and Dory that way. But still, it's a, it's a fun movie, and that was a, that was a, that was a fun scene. <laughs> I won't uh, begrudge it for that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, that's... That's kind of a side effect of, like, cartooning anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, lots of cartoonists give non-human animals very human mouths, um, which I, I remember uh, uh, Darren Nash had complained about that a couple of years back, I remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had replied, oh, I guess I have to erase the uvula on my tardigrade now. I've got to keep it accurate. Right, um, right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. Um yeah, I mean, whales, they're kind of like super mammals, are they? Right, yeah. I mean, you were talking about how penguins are kind of like, you could consider them like the pinnacle of avian evolution <laughs> yeah. um, or dinosaur evolution. Um, and whales kind of follow a similar track. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have distant ancestors come out of the water, you know, colonize the land, and you become mammals, and then just you know what, I'm going to go back to that. <laughs> and then, like, have to readjust all their anatomy yeah. in order to accommodate that lifestyle. Right. Um, you know, even going to the point of, like, completely shedding land births mm -hmm. and doing it in the water in such a neat way that, like, a nursing baby doesn't have to worry about the milk yeah. getting out into the water. Right. Because the milk is a different texture in order to, like, work in that environment. <laughs> like, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Like, that is amazing. Um. And I mean, like, just the sheer fact that most probably, yeah, the largest animal that ever lived is here yeah. right now. <laughs> um, I think in terms of, like, weight, yeah. <laughs> like, the blue whale comes out on top mm -hmm. because a, a lot of the sauropod dinosaurs would have had hollow bones that would have you know, reduced a lot of that weight. Yeah. <laughs> um, which, even though, like, they may be very long with, like, really long whippy tails, <laughs> um, like, kind of an overall weight kind of weight, like, the blue whale is, like, the one. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Which makes it all the more important to ensure that those animals have, you know, a safe home for the future. Mm -hmm. Because wouldn't it suck to have humans wipe out the largest animal in the world? Yeah. When it doesn't even really bother us all that much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh... Yeah, that's fascinating to me, for sure. Um... Yeah, unless you have uh, anything else you wanted to add about this, we can move on to your next story about the most famous fossil animal in the world. <laughs> yeah, sure thing. Uh, yeah, let's head on to the next slide and do that. And uh, yeah, it is a little bit ironic that we're doing this story after I talked about, oh, we don't like to talk about, you know, things that other people have covered. Um, but, so yeah, in general, like, <laughs> in general, there are like, two types of theropods that you'll probably almost never hear me discuss like like in terms of like uh, as a focus news story on on this episode uh, not uh, on, on the show rather um and uh so one of those is spinosaurus and the other ones are the tyrannosaurid dinosaurs including t-rex um and that's not because i don't like them uh, i think they're incredibly fascinating animals for many reasons. Um, however, uh, yeah, it's just that studies about those two groups, um, <laughs> those two theropods always get a ton of attention already, or almost always. And um, secondly, I think a lot of people have very strong opinions about those particular <laughs> animals. Um, yeah. And... Uh, yeah, <laughs> like talking about anything about how they lived or their life appearance, you, you attract a lot of drama that way. And yeah, that, that's not really my thing. Um, now, uh, you know, I, I think I think there are I think a lot of people have like particular visions of these animals that they're very, very, very attached to. And uh, in some cases, I'm not saying all, but in, in some cases, I think people tend to be more confident about what the evidence says about particular aspects of their biology then is warranted. Um, and so, yeah, in general, I just do not like to step foot in that region. Um, and indeed, this particular study that I'm going to talk about has, in fact, I, I know it has at least been covered by um, Edge, for example, which is a big, <laughs> you know, mainstream paleo YouTube channel. Um, so, uh, yeah, technically, we're, we're not really treading a lot of new ground here. Um, however, I 
do think this study was very interesting for uh, what it can potentially tell us about um, like theropods in general um, in light of like certain recent um, interpretations about their anatomy. And so I decided to uh, talk about this paper for that reason, um, even though it covers like <laughs> by far the most famous fossil animal ever, um, which I yeah nor normally would not talk about on the show. But um, yeah, let's uh, let's see what this study is actually about. Um, so this study actually shares a similar theme to a previous study that we have talked about, like um, last year. Uh, it might have been our August episode. Um, we talked about. Um, neurovascular canals in the snouts of like extinct uh, stem crocodilians that lived in the ocean um, and so these neurovascular canals are like channels through the bone uh, for blood vessels and nerves and we talked about uh, how those uh, new discoveries in the marine um, stem crocodilians uh, might you know uh, tell us uh, well, what the what they might tell us about their potential lifestyle and um because these um, these blood vessels and nerves are they're coming basically almost directly like from from the brain right so it, it, they're going straight from the brain into the snout and so a lot of these nerves they, they deal a lot with like senses or like uh, you know feeding like the, the tissues of the snout and so um, and so yeah they, they can potentially shed uh, quite a bit of light on the biology of these animals and that's why a lot of paleontologists and anatomists are very interested in studying the uh, neurovascular canals and the snouts of various different animals and so this study decided to take a look at these um, structures in the snout of tyrannosaurus rex um, yeah which needs pretty much no introduction uh, one of the largest theropod dinosaurs that we know of uh, perhaps the largest even um, and uh, yeah <laughs> gigantic um, celerosaurian a theropod. So these guys, um, they they evolved from much smaller ancestors uh, that lived throughout much of the much of the um, the Cretaceous, and also they, they originated in the Jurassic. The earliest Tyrannosauroid fossils are uh, from the Jurassic, but they were relatively small predators at the time, uh, like human size were smaller. Um, but eventually, over time, uh, as we got into the late Cretaceous um, and many of the other groups of um, large uh, theropods that were already existing at the time uh, as they died out uh, it seems that the tyrannosauroids then quickly evolved into gigantic uh, predators um, and then became like the apex predators for pretty much the rest of the cretaceous um, at least in um, in the northern hemisphere and so yeah a very interesting kind of evolutionary history from like initially small predators and medium-sized predators to uh, later on as the niches opened up becoming like some of the largest land predators of all time. Um, and uh, yeah, they have many specializations that are very interesting and make them very different from other large theropods. But uh, let's let's focus in on what this study looked at. Um, so they looked at these neurovascular canals in the snout of um, T-Rex. And uh, they were able to do this using a, a method that we have encountered before, and that is CT scanning. So they CT scanned the uh, skull of a T-Rex. And then they were able to, on a computer, like uh, identify uh, where these canals were and uh, what they were shaped like. And so that's kind of what is being shown in the figure here. So you can see that there is a set of these canals along the top of the snout in pink. There is a set um, lower down on the snout um, in blue. Um, and in the lower jaw, there's also another set of uh, these canals um, it, shown in green. And uh, so as it turns out, um, even though T-Rex has a lot of very interesting and um, unique features, um, it is actually not substantially different uh, in terms of its neurovascular um, uh, canals um, in its snout uh, compared to other types of theropods that have been looked at um, in previous studies. Um, now, it does differ uh, from the ancestral diapsid condition. So uh, diapsids, you can basically think of as the reptiles. Um, like uh, all living um, reptiles are diapsids. Uh, they belong to the diapsid group. Um, even turtles, which we used to think weren't diapsids, but turns out they actually are. Um, and uh, so, yeah, most reptiles that we know of, whether living today or in the fossil record, are members of the diapsid group. They're a very successful group. Um, and so uh, compared to the ancestral diapsid, um, Tyrannosaurus and other toothed theropods have uh, some notable differences in the um, neurovascular um, canals of the snout. Um, 
first of all, these uh, neurovascular canals, the, like the main neurovascular canal, the largest um, in each of these sets, um, it's actually displaced a little bit. So in Tyrannosaurus, for example, and, and other um, tooth theropods, the um, the the blue, the the main uh, the main branch in the blue, uh, which is along the top of the set, um, is kind of shifted upwards. Um, compared to the ancestral diapsid. So in the ancestral diapsid, the main canal here, it would be uh, located closer to the margin of the mouth, closer to the teeth. But uh, in most theropods, it has been displaced and shifted upwards. Um, and something similar happens in the lower jaw too, the main branch in the lower jaw, which would be on the bottom here. Um, it's actually shifted downward away from the teeth, uh, whereas in the ancestral diapsid, it would be closer as well to the margin of the lower jaw. And the reason for this is probably because um, in dinosaurs, the teeth are set in sockets, and in um, Tyrannosaurid dinosaurs in particular, they have very deep tooth sockets. And so, of course, these uh, canals, they had to move upward to kind of make room for those tooth sockets. Um, and furthermore, uh, Tyrannosaurus and other um, theropods also differ from the ancestral diapsid in that the maxillary canal, so the set of, of um, canals in blue, um, has a lot of dense branching going on there. So you can see that very readily uh, in the figure here. Like, yeah, in addition to the main canal running along the top, it kind of branches out into a lot of little branches uh, that run down the side of the snout. Um, and so that is something different from the ancestral diapsid condition, but has been observed previously in many other um, toothed theropods. Um, and so uh, there has been a really popular hypothesis um, that has arisen in recent years by people who have been looking at the neurovascular canals of these extinct theropods. Um, basically, the idea is that these dense uh, maxillary canals uh, might have been um, to kind of um, support a, a sensory system similar to what we see in crocodilians today. Now, crocodilians also have very dense branching in the neurovascular canal, um, um, and uh, they have a very unusual kind of sensory system on their snout. So if you look closely at the snout of uh, a living crocodilian, you can see these a lot of these little pits kind of dotting the surface of the snout, and these are like sensory pits, like each of them like connects to a little nerve. And uh, so when a crocodilian is in the water, for example, um, it can like detect uh, like vibrations in the water, like say a fish sw is swimming by, a uh, crocodilian can detect that using the pressure sensors in its snout. Um, and so it can be like some distance away from something that's interested in, like say a prey item that's like passing by, um, and then still be able to detect it using these uh, integumentary sensory organs, as they're called. Um, and uh, then it can decide what it wants to do with, with that information. Because um, um, a lot of these uh, theropods I've been looked at um, also had very dense uh, branching patterns in the neurovascular canal. Some people have suggested, oh, well, maybe this was to support like integumentary sensory organs in these extinct theropods. That's something similar to crocodilians. And so maybe they also had very sensitive snouts that they use for various activities. Like maybe they could use them um, in social displays. Like they could rub their snouts together in courtship or they could... Um, uh, maybe tend to their eggs. They could use um, the the um, their snouts to like uh, maybe test the temperature of their nests, for example. Uh, these are all very very interesting and uh, evocative ideas. Um, however, uh, the authors of this new paper uh, kind of provide a word of caution. Um, so they point out that even though uh, these uh, branching patterns in the snout of Tyrannosaurus and other um, tooth theropods are dense uh, compared to the ancestral diapsid condition, um, they are still not as dense as what we actually see in crocodilians. Um, and uh, we also know that some other um, aquatic and semi-aquatic um, diapsids appear to have had uh, similar dense branching patterns uh, to crocodilians. Uh, but uh, in most theropods, uh, the uh, this um, this branching pattern, like as complex as it might look on this slide, is still not as complex as what we see in those semi-aquatic reptiles. Um, they do point out that some of the uh, Mesozoic theropods have been considered possibly semi-aquatic, might be exceptions to this, like they might actually um, have had such sensory adaptations. Um, so that would be like the Spinosaurids have been suggested to have this, for example, and also um, Hoscaraptor, a little um, Dromaeosaurid that has been suggested to be possibly a semi-aquatic feeder, um, also has been interpreted to have these uh, possible, uh, you know, these dense branching patterns feeding like sensory organs on the snout. Um, 
And so they, they might be possible exceptions to this, but by and large, a typical kind of theropod pattern uh, still has some notable differences from crocodilians. And so uh, we probably should not automatically assume that uh, they are, uh, you know, giving support to these uh, sensory organs, specialized sensory organs on the snout. Um, they also point out that uh, you know, there, there could be alternative explanations for this dense branching pattern. Um, so these are neurovascular canals. And so if we break that down, like neuro means uh, nerves and referring to nerves. Um, however, nerves are only part of the story because these canals do not only contain nerves. Uh, the other part of that term is vascular. And so vascular refers to blood vessels. And um, so and we're not really sure, in fact, like whether... Uh, the nerves or the blood vessels are like representing a larger proportion of the space in these canals um, that we're observing in these dinosaurs. It's possible that maybe they were feeding not like more sensitive nerves, but uh, more uh, like denser blood vessels. And um, why why might that be? Uh, well, it's possible that they might have had maybe. Uh, some sort of display structure, like maybe a keratin a sheet on the snout, that's possible, um, that was uh, uh, being fed by a, a larger, a denser um, set of blood vessels. We know that uh, keratin structures um, like that anchor closely to the surface of the bone often have um, very dense uh, neurovascular canals feeding them. That's the case in like the beaks of birds, for example. Um, and so, yeah, we can't automatically assume uh, or at least we shouldn't automatically assume that the uh, the the dense branching pattern here is indicative of crocodilian like sensory abilities. So what would help the case uh, would be uh, studying um, like correlates of what they call ganglion size. And so ganglions are like bundles of neurons um, that like basically come out of the kind of kind of the brain. Um, and uh, basically the um, the ganglia that are associated with the sense of touch in the snout um, would we would expect them to be particularly well developed if um, these dinosaurs had like specialized um, uh, senses of touch in the snout, and so if maybe studying the size of like the potential the potential size of the nerves of the ganglia um, that are like coming straight out of the brain would be able to corroborate or. Uh, you know, falsify the hypothesis that they had, like crocodilian, like sensory abilities, but we need to be careful. Um, and finally, the authors also comment a little bit about the possibility of lips. Now, yeah, this is another um, topic that in the online paleo community, if you mention anything about lips, you'll <laughs> probably, yeah, start a huge flame war. Um, yeah, the idea of did these dinosaurs have lips covering their teeth? Or not. So, like that, that's a condition that is seen in you know most types of um, uh, backboned animals. Um, you you see it in lizards. If we want to take a modern reptile example, if a lizard if it's just like kind of sitting there, uh, not not doing much and not like specifically opening its mouth, uh, you you can't really see the teeth uh, because the the teeth are being covered by like these tissues. These uh, we can call them lips, I suppose, in a broad sense. Um, and even a lot of time when lizards do open their mouth, they, a lot of the time their, their teeth are not all that noticeable because, yeah, they, they have quite extensive lips, like, in uh, surrounding, surrounding them. Um, whereas in, say, a crocodile, uh, the teeth are exposed and they don't have any lips. And so because um, dinosaurs are more closely related to crocodiles and to lizards, uh, a lot of, like, classic paleo art um, tends to depict um, toothed dinosaurs without lips and uh, showing the, the teeth exposed similar to crocodilians. But other people have since, you know, kind of debated this and said, well, yeah, crocodilians are pretty specialized. We can't automatically assume the soft tissues are the same uh, as it is um, like in, in um, extinct dinosaurs. Uh, so maybe like a condition similar to like the typical uh, backboned animal condition where there are lips might be more plausible. So that, that's the argument at least. Um, and so, of course, um, being able to study the um, kind of these uh, structures that interact with the soft tissue on the snout um, is could potentially give us some clues as to what type of tissues were present. Um, so the authors do comment on this a little bit, and they say, yeah, uh, if we, it, it is possible that if we better understand these structures, we can get an idea of whether or not these dinosaurs had lips, um, especially if, like we can correlate them with like patterns seen in living animals. However, uh, the studies that have been done so far, uh, they don't 
really give us enough information to tell like one way or another that's that's the author's stance um so more data is needed especially from like living animals like exactly what kind of branching patterns correlate with lips if any at all um so yeah more re future research is needed if we want to answer the lip question and that's uh, their uh, their comment on that um so yeah, I think um, this study, uh, uh, even though it focuses on tyrannosaurs, it has a lot of very interesting implications. And um, I am really glad that some of these things uh, were, you know, these authors actually came out and said of some of these things, um, because I know like even, like I remember even very far back, like, well, it's not that far back, but like, like a number of years ago when people were first proposing like uh, crocodilian like sensory abilities in theropod dinosaurs, um, there were already researchers and uh, who specialize in studying like soft tissue anatomy of reptiles, um, especially in the in the face and the, in the head. Um, and they, they were saying like, you know, people might be jumping the gun here. Uh, like we, we don't we don't know for sure that these uh, these canals automatically indicate like crocodilian like um, sensory organs. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's been a while uh, uh, without there hasn't been much really much a formal response um, to this idea in the scientific literature. Uh, if anything, like more people have been coming out and saying, "Oh yeah, I saw these dense canals in theropods, so probably it's the same thing was going on. They had crocodilian like sensory abilities." But uh, yeah, I, I like let the authors put in a, like this word of caution in their paper here. Um, like saying like you know hold on like we, we need to understand these systems better um and i know that one of the authors on this paper um emily lesner um has been doing a lot of work um like in this uh, on this topic like trying to figure out like just how similar to crocodilians are like these theropod neurovascular canals really um and she has presented a lot of this work at conferences um but um but most of it is not published yet. Um, so I'm really looking forward to when that eventually um, comes out. Um, I do um, remember that last year at um, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology Conference, um, SVP, um, I, I did um, uh, take a look at her presentation and I asked her about, oh, so do, do you think that um, like semi-aquatic theropods like Spinosaurids and Halscoraptor were, you know, had a different condition um, from like what we're seeing in like other types of theropods? And she answered that uh, she had not had a chance to like examine those particular species um, yet at, the, at least at the time um, however uh, you know she would obviously be interested in doing that for, as part of her work so uh, yeah I'm, I'm really looking forward to what more comes out of that and uh, yeah I think uh, this is a pretty important study so you know I don't really mind covering it again here even though other people have already done so um, do you have any thoughts on this well I think uh, well I'm actually very curious because I, I, I agree this is fascinating too I'm surprised nobody's ever done like it's, it's like compiled all this research that's been done on Tyrannosaurus, all the CT yeah. scans, all the anatomical data into like one big manual of, <laughs> of like T-Rex anatomy right. that we can absolutely know for sure like what parts we need to study more than others. Right, right. Because, um, uh, yeah, I guess the whole croc analogies that you've been talking about here, I guess it's kind of like a consequence of relying on a phylogenetic bracketing too much because mm -hmm. um, yeah because i mean of course, uh, crocodiles and alligators that whole group um crocodilomorphs um they are the closest living relatives to the dinosaurs so if you're just focusing on living animals they and birds would share a, more of a, com a closer common ancestry than like crocodiles and lizards um, which is very funny to think about mm. But of course, if you're familiar with dinosaurs, like it's it, it makes absolute sense. Um, but the, there's also the understanding that crocodilomorphs have very like specialized anatomy a lot of the a lot of the times, and and they were doing things different from like what dinosaurs were doing. Yeah. So I I think trying to find, I mean, like it it it, it would be one thing if like the similarities had any basis, like that's always a possibility. But I think I feel like there's there's like more of a there's more of a sense of that happening between crocodiles and dinosaurs than any other organisms, mm -hmm. you know, where, oh, these things are, are related to crocodiles, therefore they'll probably share all the features that we see in crocodiles today that that we can tell about. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I am, I'm definitely curious to see, like, what these, these maxillaries could mean. Um, yeah, the, the the lip situation is really funny <laughs> to me, because yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess everybody has their opinion on this. Um, 
You know, it, I was just thinking, Charles Knight, mm-hmm. the the American paleo artist from way back in the day, turn of the century. Um, I think in some of his earlier artwork, he actually did depict his Tyrannosaurus and his Allosaurus with lips he did, like yeah. a lizard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when he was doing the Field Museum murals, which everybody's seen, mm. um, I think he he gave them like toothy, <laughs> like either visible through through the mouth uh, when, when the mouth is closed, yeah, yeah. Um, or at at least some of the teeth are visible, like they kind of got like a buck tooth situation right. going, going on, um, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that I know that that's kind of that's that's quite the tangent because there's there's a whole story behind how Charles Knight did his dinosaurs. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> but that really reminds me too. I know. So we talk about dinosaur lips. Dinosaur cheeks mm-hmm. is another one too oh, yeah. <laughs> that I remember being a, a big issue. I, I still don't even know where we are on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As I, the dinosaurs I grew up with, the Triceratops and Stegosaurus, all the herbivores, um, they had kind of like, well, they would have beaks, mm-hmm. but then like beyond the beak, everything would be like a mammalian cheek, right, right, um, because they had very cheek, well, cheek teeth ish dentition, yeah, like <laughs> the teeth aren't in the front of the mouth, um, and so like that kind of gives that impression, um, but now I'm seeing more and more reconstructions where they're giving them, I guess, a more reptilian. Mm-hmm. Condition where the mouth is open all the way to like the back of the jaw, mm-hmm. and so like when they would open the mouth, so there's no cheeks. Yeah. Those teeth are visible, um, which yeah, I, I, I'm actually very curious about that. Um, but no, I think that is very fascinating, and uh, um, I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate when researchers are honest mm-hmm. with these sorts of things. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. rather than just being the, that person to just take the stance and, and run with it like they're leaving it open yeah. because mm-hmm. it is so contentious and rather than kind of fuel the flames like they listen like whether this will help or hurt that model you know this is what we found yeah. and, and we need more work and at the end of the day like that's the best answer you can really give mm-hmm. um so I, I i do see these sorts of things about you know crocodile like faces versus lips versus cheeks yeah. like we just we need more data mm-hmm. like, we, we, what we really need is like a I don't like the hadrosaur mummies, I feel like mm. some of these animals that might that might help us out a little right, bit. Right, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sadly, um, the soft Coffee. tissues of the face are often uh, quickly one of the first things to be lost. So yeah, we, we would have to be we would have to find a really spectacular fossil to to do it, but uh, we can hope. <laughs> oh yeah, or like a really good skin impression. Right. Like I, I remember somebody shared a, a photo a while back. There was a, an Asian elephant that was resting on the ground in some dirt and i guess it got up in just the right way Mm -hmm. that it left like a near complete like impression of like it's of the skin of its face right 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 down to all the wrinkles which that is awesome to begin with but like imagine if the conditions were just right Mm -hmm. to where that was preserved then future paleontologists would have like the face of an elephant with like no bones yeah (laughs) it's like what is this yeah this is insane (laughs) um That'd be cool to find for a T Rex or mm-hmm. another dinosaur. Oh yeah, I think I think we'd love, love, love to have that. Um, in fact, um, there is actually a um, uh, a fossil of a theropod with uh, basically a, you know a complete uh, mold of its face. However, that theropod is a living vulture. Uh, well, it, it's not living anymore, but like it's a it's a living species of vulture. Um, <laughs> that you know from from the recent Cenozoic. So uh, yeah, we, we don't have one for a Mesozoic theropods yet, but it shows that it's possible. So uh, yeah, we, we can cross our fingers and try to try to find some uh, some uh, rock formations that be conducive to that, and maybe we'll strike gold. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed for sure. Um, <laughs> well, all right, cool. Um, I guess if, if if there was anything else you wanted to add, did we want to jump into our last story? Here? Oh, uh, sure. Um, yeah, I guess the last thing I would just comment on it was the question of cheeks, I guess. Yeah, because like, like you said, um, cheeks haven't really been proposed for um, most theropod dinosaurs. Um, and so they, they, they weren't really concerned with that in, in this study. But yeah, it is a big um, question in when it comes to the Ornithischian dinosaurs, the so-called bird hip dinosaurs, even though they're more distantly related to birds. Um, and uh, I, I believe the, like the latest um, thinking um, is that uh, there isn't any evidence for like uh, the particular muscle that um, 
that uh, forms the cheek in mammals uh, in these dinosaurs. So they, they probably didn't have exactly a mammalian kind of cheek where there was an extra muscle there to make the cheek. Um, however, there is evidence that like some of the jaw muscle was probably sort of extended forward onto the lower jaw. And so there might have been a little bit of a, a flap there nonetheless. Um, and it is possible that there was, there was like skin that was further extending it. So like, yeah, so it, it's kind of like, you know, not they probably weren't cheeked in the way that mammals were, but they might have been sort of cheeked anyway. <laughs> it's a yeah, it, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting question for sure. Um, and probably there was you know, it wouldn't surprise me if there was variation within the different groups of Ornithischians in that regard. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, so I, I don't know what the name of this is, mm -hmm. but I've seen a lot of reconstructions of dinosaurs where like they're opening their mouths, yeah. roaring or whatever, and like right where the lower jaw meets the upper jaw. Mm -hmm or I guess the, the, the maxilla, there's like, like right, and just after the teeth, yeah, yeah. there's like a, a um, like a pink fleshy yeah, yeah, like, yeah. stretch of skin. Like, what is that? Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's called the uh, rictus. Uh, yeah, which is, yeah, basically the soft tissue at the corner of the mouth, which is, yeah, which is seen in like uh, modern reptiles. Um, so yeah, I guess it's not out of the question to depict it in extinct dinosaurs. Um, yeah, well, what it would actually look like in life, I, whether it would have looked like just a pink flap like that, I, I'm not so sure, but uh, but uh, it it might might well be a structure that was there. And, and in fact, um, I, I recall that you uh, you actually included it in my avatar for our uh, title slides. So so uh, yeah, it's there. Uh, anyone wants to take a look at that? <laughs> oh, I did, didn't I? Let me. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I I've just kind of taken it as a given. Yeah, yeah. Like whenever I've drawn dinosaurs, I just put it in there because that's right. kind of like all I've seen. Mm -hmm. Um, but I. Uh, I also I have also seen I guess newer artworks where they don't put that in there. Mm. They kind of make it more like, well, less distinct. Right, I guess. right, yeah. Um, but uh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that maybe that is kind of like what. Maybe they had an extended mm -hmm. version of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that seems possible. <laughs> I guess time will tell. <laughs> Indeed. Um, <laughs> but yeah. But uh, yes, all right. Our next uh, um, story is also about uh, the nerves of a, a large animal, so uh, that that's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, it worked out super well. Uh, we got big animals and what makes them tick. Um, <laughs> yep. So, yeah, so the, the trunk of the elephant is an amazing organ. It is a feat of evolutionary engineering, if you like. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very sensitive yet powerful. Uh, this elongation of the animal's nose and upper lip, which is what the trunk is, uh, functions like an arm and hand, which elephants don't exactly have at the ends of their columnar limbs. Um, it is strong enough to push and lift a tree trunk, yet it is delicate enough to pick up objects from the ground as small as coins. Hmm. Um, I think there's actually like one account where an elephant can like uh, open a peanut mm. and, and take the nut out without breaking it. Right. Um, you know, which is good when you're a browsing mammal that needs to navigate foliage in search of particular leaves and fruits and bark. Um, there was a 2021 study by Andrew K. Schultz and colleagues that discovered that elephants can even use their trunk like a vacuum <laughs> so they can suck up foods, like delicate foods that way to make it easier for them. Mm. Um, and, of course, it also makes a great siphon for pulling water out of a lake or a stream mm -hmm. and directing it right into the mouth. So, no, it's not a straw. Um, <laughs> the water only... <laughs> yeah, you see that in cartoons sometimes. Yeah. Like, in Dumbo, they had that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the water only goes up the trunk about 40 centimeters, um, and uh, it can put it into the mouth. Where, in fact, there's even, like, a little pouch, mm. like, near the esophagus where it can, like, store extra water for mm. later. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like the crop of a bird. Um, it's really neat. Um, now, the trunk isn't you know just used for food and drink. Uh, it can be used for defense and attack, of course. Uh, and you know, weighing around 100 kilograms means that you, you don't want to be on the receiving end of it. Oh, yeah. um, now, elephants, you know, being highly social animals, they also use their trunk for communication. They can raise it up to trumpet, or they can gently touch the face of a fellow herd member, get some vital information. Uh, and their sense of smell is extraordinary. Uh, they have the largest known number of olfactory receptors of any mammal, around 2,000, which is twice as many as a dog and five times as many as a human. Um, 
there was a 2019 study by Joshua M. Plotnick and colleagues that even demonstrated that elephants can tell the quantity of a given food source mm. by smell alone. So it's like there's nothing it can't do. Leopold Barton colleagues, and this is our, our paper for today, they painstakingly dissected the heads of eight zoo elephants of both the Asian and African varieties uh, that had died naturally or were euthanized for health problems. Given how difficult it is to cut into an elephant's skull and examine the brain and nervous system, this doesn't happen often. You, you kind of take what you can get. Now, the authors wanted to study the trigeminal system. So this, this is the part of the nervous system located under the brain that deals with facial senses based on touch. So things like detecting temperature or sensing pain. And a key part of the system is the trigeminal ganglion, uh, the largest such cranial nerve clump, mm -hmm. uh, which makes the elephant that much bigger, um, which helps with sensation. And it's here, as well as in the infraorbital nerve, that the authors focus their attention on. As you can see in the image to the far left, that sensory nerve extends all the way down the trunk. Now, before moving forward, uh, Albert, you brought this to my attention. This paper made a very important omission in describing the elephant's trigeminal system. So according to uh, Ali Nabivize, uh, who's a comparative anatomist who studies elephants and other big animals, mm -hmm. Um, the authors had stated that the infraorbital nerve, which innervates into the trunk, you know, is important for sensory functions, but they neglected to add that those particular nerves are also important for motor functions, mm. as the infraorbital nerve is connected to the facial nerve. In fact, uh, when those two nerves are considered together, um, they're often called the proboscidial nerve, mm -hmm. which is after the elephant's trunk, so they can be considered like one large nerve. Um, now, those aspects of anatomy are not covered in the author's analysis, uh, which focus solely on the infraorbital nerve, as if it worked solely for sensation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, hopefully Ali will publish a response to this paper correcting for these things, but for the moment, we'll have to kind of keep all this in mind going forward. So, okay. In studying the trigeminal ganglion, the authors found that not only are the overall dimensions large, but the size of the corresponding sensory neuron is appropriately large, too. Uh, it's estimated at 2.1 meters long, of which 1.6 meters runs along the trunk itself. The connection to the infraorbital nerve, known as the maxillary branch, is larger than the other branches of the ganglion, uh, that being the mandibular the ophthalmic, and is in fact wider in diameter than the proximal spinal cord. And that means, and I'm going to quote the authors here, the sensory innervation of the elephant trunk exceeds the connections of the elephant's brain, the elephant's body, and neural mass. Wow. And that's pretty significant, yeah. you know, to... <laughs> now, of note is that the nerve fibers are also fairly large, too. Mm -hmm. um, at max, they are 12.3 micrometers in diameter. And so if you're comparing that to a human axon, that's just one micrometer. <laughs> so, yeah, big seems to be the, the theme here. Now, uh, the big shock of the paper was the quantification of nerve fibers. Uh, on average, an elephant has 400,000 axons in their infraorbital nerve, and as this nerve innervates into the trunk, that massive number is organized into successive branches that get thinner the further you go down, but a majority of them are bundled towards the very end of the trunk, where the lips are. And just for reference, uh, an, elef an African elephant has two lips, an Asian elephant has one. Hmm. These kind of act like the fingers of the trunk, so a good way to tell them apart. Uh, now, the amount of axons in an elephant is significant compared to what researchers were originally speculating. But just to make sure that the authors weren't overemphasizing what would be an appropriately big amount of sensory nerves for a species of megafauna, they actually compared their findings with the other nerves of the, of the elephant's brain, uh, specifically the optic nerve, which concerns seeing, mm -hmm. and the vestibulocochlear nerve, which concerns hearing and balance. 
as the etymology suggests. Mm. And it turns out the authors were not exaggerating. Uh, as you can see in the image at the center, uh, an elephant's infraorbital nerve is larger than them both. Yeah. And so charts B and C kind of clarify those size discrepancies. Uh, B shows the measurements in diameter between the nerves. And C is showing the nerve fiber counts in comparison with a rat and a pig. Um, but like here you can see how many axons a pig has in its optic nerve compared to its infraorbital nerve. But in the elephant, the amount is almost on par with the optic nerve. Now, the complexity of the elephant's trigeminal ganglion and infraorbital nerve is certainly cause for great excitement. Mm -hmm. um, though the authors remain cautious in going too far with their results just yet, you know, being responsible like I was mentioning, mm -hmm. the data does suggest that the elephant's trunk may very well be one of the most sensitive and tactile organs known for any animal. Um, given the precision needed to do so many things that it does, mm -hmm. it makes sense yep. that an elephant would need strong architecture in its nervous system in order to use it as well as it does. Um, but let's hope that further research, as well as the appropriate connections by Ali Nabevazadeh, mm -hmm. can help clarify this information. Um, so I thought this was incredibly fascinating. Uh, what about you, Albert? Yeah, so did I. Um, and I mean, like kind of similar to whales, like elephants are just extreme, um, animals in many ways. And, uh, they're, they're definitely one of those animals where like, you know, if, if you didn't know of elephants, could you like come up with one in your imagination? Like, like it might be hard. It might be <laughs> hard. Like, <laughs> I'll just say that, um, and uh, it, it is always incredible to find out you know, new things about elephants as well. And uh, this is a, certainly a very good example of that. Um, but yeah, I, I do think we need to keep um, Ali's comments in mind. And it's kind of funny that you bring up his work because um, he, he was also the one who did the uh, study I, I kind of mentioned earlier about uh, the jaw musculature of like bird hip dinosaurs. So yeah, he's actually responsible for a lot of that work. Um, Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of lots of shout outs to um Ali Nabavi's day in, in our episode here. Uh, I should probably put a link to that paper then uh, in the in the description. But uh yeah, uh no, it's, this is this is an amazing study and uh just seeing the size of that nerve compared to the others, it that that's that's mind blowing. It's incredible. Uh it's, yeah, really cool. <laughs> oh yeah, and um of course it, it should be stressed like like just how remarkable the trunk is yes um like there's no bones in there mm -hmm. that's all you know muscles and and tendons and nerves um which you know I, it's funny that i say this like i've actually seen cartoons where they draw an elephant skeleton and oh, they yeah. make bones through the trunk that's right <laughs> it's like it's like no it's actually a lot weirder than that. yeah right um, <laughs> <laughs> like also just the fact that it's the nose mm -hmm. and the upper lip yep. mm -hmm. like that's the really weird thing yep. um but of course it, if you're familiar with elephant evolution and all the uh, the, the non-elephant proboscideans mm -hmm. which is that, that the total group um you can kind of very clearly see how that happened yeah. um you go from animals like moratherium which if i remember correctly they have kind of like a fleshy nose um they probably didn't have like the trunk of a tapir like some of the older reconstructions had. Um, I'm just going based on what I remember. Mm -hmm. um, but like you can see like how the 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 nose extends over time to accommodate different behaviors. Uh, eventually, going to things like gomphotheres, where like the jaw is actually trying to keep up yeah, for yeah. a bit, <laughs> right? Or eventually, just like giving up and becoming the little fleshy lip mm -hmm. that an elephant has today. Um, which, yeah, oh my gosh, there, there's, okay. you're, you're right, there's so many things about elephant anatomy that just make them remarkable. Um, their teeth always interested oh, me, yeah. too. <laughs> so, uh, mammals don't constantly replace their teeth um, like like other animals do, like sharks. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, like, a limited number of sets, yep. and that's it. And sometimes, if you're lucky, like you're a rodent, you know, your teeth are just constantly growing. Yep. <laughs> you got to kind of whittle them down. But others, like, you have a set, you use it until it's done, mm. and then that's it. Yep. Mm. Um, of course, humans have, have two sets. Um, but elephants, I believe they have, like, they have three sets each. 
um, I would have to get the specifics on this. But what, what essentially happens is the elephant has like a big, one big tooth um, on either side of its jaws. And uh, it, it looks kind of like a loaf of bread <laughs> with a lot of like ribbing on it. That's right. Um, it, it varies from, from species to species. And I know like if you look at mastodons, which oh. are not elephants, but close relatives, they have a whole different arrangement, yep. which actually gives it, which gives them their name, mm-hmm. incidentally. Somebody thought their teeth looked like boobs, yeah. so it, it means breast tooth, and that's what mastodon means. Um, which is funny because now mastodon is synonymous with like big things, right? So it, it, it's a little bit of etymology funness going on there. Um, but anyway, so the elephant has this, this one tooth in each part of the jaw, and you know, it grinds and grinds and grinds, and it basically wears it down, yep. and eventually it has to like. It, it drops, mm-hmm. so it, it spits the tooth out, and then you get a second one that comes in, into its place, you know, fresh off the block, ready to go, until it's done. And yeah, I think this happens about three times, which after that, mm. um, that's it. The elephant can't eat anymore, and it dies. And so you can kind of tell, I believe like you can tell the age of an elephant by like how worn down oh, yeah. the teeth are, and, 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 and like how many are, are, are in development stage, ready to go. Um, but they're remarkable organs, nonetheless. Mm. And yeah. Uh, mm. yeah, I guess in a way, like they are kind of cheap teeth. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which means that the 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 tusks are incisors. Mm-hmm. So uh, some people say like they're canines because like they're, they're long and pointy. No, no, no. That's that's the front teeth. Um, y- you can kind of see it in the illustration on the on on the far left. Yeah. Um, how like the 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 maxilla. Is just kind of pushed out mm-hmm. in the front of the face to pull the incisors forward, and of course the the trunk mass then dishes them apart from each other mm-hmm. and, and gives that sort of canineish appearance. Um, but yeah, no, the like the tusk is a tooth. It's it's a very long tooth, um, and I, I believe like they, those those grow continually. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, but the cheek teeth don't. So it, it's it's <laughs> it's a very interesting arrangement. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Like, and um, just trying to kind of visualize it yourself is, is tough. Like, right. what, what if humans were like that? <laughs> yeah, Ooh. yeah. Like, uh, basically, what's happening is, um, is, is that yeah, each each tooth that comes in, it's like it's like the equivalent to like one of our cheek teeth, and so that, that's kind of why they have a limit. Is that uh, basically instead of like all their teeth like all coming into their mouth at once, uh, they just use like the first set of teeth. They they kind of, those teeth kind of slide forward and get used, and then and then the next set comes in, uh, and kind of it slides forward in like a conveyor belt, and then and then that set gets used. And eventually, they use their last uh, last set of set of cheek teeth, and that's that's why they they can't grow anymore. So it's not like it's not quite a system that's like uh, like what you see in other types of vertebrates like. Uh, fishes and, and reptiles where like it's the the body continually like produces new teeth um, but instead they just kind of hold on to some of their teeth uh, for a while and just kind of use them sequentially like that like keep them in reserve um, so yeah it's, a, it's an interesting way that they've kind of gotten around at least somewhat the uh, the kind of constraint that most mammals have by having only two sets of teeth um, now the first the first set of teeth that they have is like us it, it's their it's their baby teeth um, and but when that's done like that they they start kind of using their adult set of teeth in parts, and that's that's what's happening with the replacement teeth there. And yeah, they're very fascinating. They're definitely a really unusual adaptation. <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, and yeah, like just, just just looking at the trunk itself. I mean, yeah, I'm not kidding. Like it, it's very versatile. Mm-hmm. Um, and like elephants have like seem to have very good dexterity with it as well. Yes. Um, I've seen the videos of the elephants putting garbage away so uh, i believe these are at like safari parks in east africa tanzania kenya where there's like little recycling bins and people sometimes miss the bins they throw (laughs) the cans on the ground and the elephant comes and can like kind of curl its trunk in a way to pick up the can and put it (laughs) put it in the garbage (laughs) it's like like they they get it Mm. they know what's up um yeah, just remarkably intelligent animals too. I mean, like that brain, uh, you gotta wonder what's going on in there. Yeah. Um, I mean, like their social behaviors, their like elephants never forget. Like that's <laughs> that's there's truth to that. Mm-hmm. They have very good memories. Yes, and you know their social structure is important 
because the the matriarch, mm-hmm. you know, the higher ups are are usually the oldest members of the group. They are the ones who remember from their childhood all the all the good watering holes and eating places, mm-hmm. um, and so all the elephants follow them into those particular directions, which is important when you consider how you know big game hunters often go after you know the big elephants yeah. and they they go after the matriarchs, which you're basically destroying cultural mm-hmm. knowledge. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, for those elephant herbs when you do that um but like yeah like highly emotional it seems uh they understand death in a way uh, there's a there's often a lots of, of of documented cases where elephants will come across bones on the ground and they like take turns like running their trunk along the bones in kind of like a like a, almost like a solemn state yeah. like they just kind of sit there and, and and just look over these bones and then move on mm-hmm. It's like, what does it mean? Do they rec- are they trying to recognize the individual? Is it just kind of a general like self-respect? Good question. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> um, so like, yeah, I guess this is all kind of a roundabout way of saying. I, I look at studies like this, and I'm just like further amazed at how incredible elephants are. Mm-hmm. And and even an animal as familiar as an elephant, you know, there's still many secrets in there that we're still trying to unravel and mm-hmm. we'll probably continue to unravel for time to come but uh yeah that's basically all i had to say on that um did you have any kind of final comments albert uh no not really could have put it better myself really (laughs) oh well thank you thank you um but with that that is it for our nature news episode um if we move on to there are successive slides here um yes we still have our interview we're still you know kind of waiting for the right date to come uh we, we will get there when we get there um, but if you are interested in sending questions to Miles and or Trey, uh, you can send them through all of the acquired means. You can go to the YouTube comments section, you can email us, or you can leave a comment on Twitter. And uh, we will try to incorporate them as best as we can into our review, uh, into our interview there. Um, and of course, uh, we are on Patreon. So if you're interested in supporting us, through monetary donations, you can go to patreon.com slash timeandclades, where your contributions will help us to continue the series and develop new projects and expansions. Um, in fact, in the time since our Encanto review, we have gained another Patreon. And so now we have four patrons here, and they are all up tiers for shoutouts. So we want to give a huge thanks and a big hug to my sister Julie, our friends Ilari in Denver, and our patron, Paul, who's left us many wonderful correspondences. Mm-hmm. Um, we appreciate everything, you guys. Thank you so much. And uh, um, here's to you know future episodes, thanks to your support. And, of course, we'd also like to acknowledge our good friends, Henry and Alicia, for their contributions to the series. Henry, of course, is responsible for our wonderful theme music. And uh, Albert's friend, Alicia, is responsible for Albert's Alphasaur Avatar color scheme. Mm-hmm. So very wonderful artwork that she contributed to um and of course we are on twitter where we post updates to upcoming episodes so that is at time and clades but most likely you are watching us on our youtube page through time and clades so please consider giving us a a like and a subscription where you can keep up and get updates on future releases um again if you have any questions for us specifically whether they are questions about the stories in this episode or any general questions at all You can email us, timeandclades at gmail.com, or of course you can leave us a comment on YouTube or on our Twitter page. And of course, uh, if you are interested in reading these papers that we talked about, as well as others that were used in uh, or or mentioned in this episode, we have, uh, you can check out the description for the links to those specific papers where we list everything there. Um, And with that, that is it for for our episode today. Um... What's going on next? Well, next week um, on the 12th is Darwin Day. So that is basically the celebration of Charles Darwin's birthday, as well as his lifetime of achievements. And uh, we're working on something special for that. Mm -hmm. We'll, uh, you'll know when you know. Keep an eye out for it it on the 12th. And I think you'll be very pleased with that. But that is it. Thank you all so much for joining us, and uh, we hope you have a wonderful day. Yep, absolutely. Have a good one. Take care.